adopted from uh, Mission Impossible. Because some of the technologies I want to share with you today were at one point um, thought to be impossible or at least in the realm of science fiction. And many of them involve um, creating new nanomaterials that interact with light in extremely unique ways. So um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction to what it is that my group does at Stanford University. Um, I am a professor of material science and engineering. Um, and there I run a lab of material scientists, chemists, electrical engineers, and applied physicists who are all very interested in basically understanding and controlling molecular and nanoscale systems using light. So how can we use light to really understand things that are conventional and kind of unseen and then control those processes. So some of the questions that really drive what my group is thinking about and what we're passionate about include, can small molecules or proteins be optically trapped, manipulated, and imaged? So can we use focused laser beams to trap small molecules or small proteins, just like a tweezer would hold a small object, but instead we're holding these small molecules with light and then moving them around, and then also getting detailed structural information about these small molecules and small proteins despite the fact that these structures are much smaller than the wavelength of light. Another question that we're extremely interested in pursuing is whether catalytic reactions or chemical reactions can be observed at the single molecule or single particle level. So rather than looking through a chemistry textbook and seeing, okay, these are the reaction mechanisms that we think are occurring, can we follow individual molecules as they're reacting with each other and really see what's happening during a chemical reaction in terms of electron transfer and atomic rearrangement. Another question we're addressing is whether low energy photons can be efficiently harvested in solar cells. So can we take light that normally is transmitted straight through a photovoltaic cell or a photocatalytic cell so it's not absorbed, but then use that light um, and kind of combine those photons in such a way where they can be absorbed by the solar cell. And then the last question we're exploring um, that uh, the press always loves is, can objects be made invisible? So the first three <laughs> questions kind of uh, pertain to, can we make objects visible that we normally can't see? The last one is, can we take objects that we can see and make them invisible? So my talk today will touch on these last two questions, um, just because Piero says, I only have 20 minutes and I know he's very strict with the time. So if you have questions about the first two, please let me know. And hopefully if there are future lasers, I can come back and maybe talk about some of those topics. So while all of these questions are seemingly diverse, addressing them requires new techniques to control the interaction of light with matter. So I didn't always want to be a nanoscientist. Many people ask me how did I get into this field, and I thought I'd give you a bit of um, an introduction to uh, what I wanted to be um, when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my first goal when I was about four or five years old was to be a skating magician. Um, I grew up on the East Coast in Rhode Island. Um, I started figure skating when I was three. I continued skating up until um, college. Um, but at the time, I thought it'd be really fun to combine figure skating and putting on magic tricks. I'd always do card shows or uh, different like illusions for my neighbors. Um, unfortunately, when it came to performing a double axel and pulling a rabbit out of a hat, that never quite worked so well in combination. So I think my parents were pretty happy um, when I gave up uh, that goal. Um, but given my interest in performing when I was younger, um, my next goal was to become a Hollywood star. <laughs> um, I actually got um, pretty close when I got a call from a nearby agency around the time I was 20, um, Caltech. <laughs> That's where I wound up doing my PhD um, in applied physics. Um, so unfortunately, I never you know, made it quite as a star, um, but at least I met some scientific stars along the way, including Stephen Hawking. Um, and I've also interacted with Jamie and Adam from Mythbusters. Actually, this quarter I'm teaching a class at Stanford on science of the impossible. Um, and just the other day, some of the Mythbusters crew came to my class to kind of share what it's like to, you know, bust myths and really figure out, like, how do you tackle science? It kind of seems impossible. Okay, so given that plan A and plan B didn't work out um, when I was younger, another one of my goals was um, to be a paranormal researcher. I grew up really fascinated by, like, the X-Files and Ghostbusters. Um, and I think 
My parents were a little bit concerned when, yeah, around the time I was 10 or 11, I did want to study the paranormal. Um, right now, my research, I think, is very rooted in reality, but there are some aspects of kind of the uh, unknown world that I think uh, really, in some sense, uh, kind of drove um, my interest in the paranormal. Like when I was younger, I just wanted to explain things that um, were kind of unknown, to see the unseen, um, and really probe deeper um, into reality, like understanding things that didn't have any explanation that my parents could provide at the time. So, um, <clears throat> probably one of the uh, most natural elements that drove my interest in, in optics um, was butterflies and structural color. Probably many of you are familiar with the blue morpho butterfly shown here. Many of the oranges and browns arise just from like pigments in the butterfly wings, just small molecules that act kind of like dyes to give the butterfly wings its color. But the blue arises from structural color. So I'll show you some microscope images that kind of zoom into the butterfly wings. So basically the blue arises from uh, multiple scales. Some butterfly species have up to 10 different layers of scales. And as you zoom in even further, you'll notice that these scales are arranged very periodically. And now using an electron microscope to image the microstructure of these scales, you can see that there's this ladder-like periodicity where the runs of the ladder are spaced by dimensions on the order of a micron. So a micron is a thousand nanometers. And just for reference, visible light has wavelengths between about 400 and 700 nanometers. So the periodicity of this ladder-like structure is approximately on the order of the wavelength of visible light. And I should mention that this ladder-like structure is composed of chicken. It's basically a glassy or natural like sugar-like substance that in bulk and without this periodicity would appear transparent, a lot like glass. So it's just the structuring that gives rise to the color. It's nothing about the material itself that gives rise to its optical properties. And you'll see this theme come up again and again in my talk where basically we're going to take normal materials, but then structure them in such a way where the emergent optical properties are very distinct from any of the constituent elements. So here are a few examples of some of the nanomaterials that we work with and we make in my laboratory, um, one of which is metallic nanoparticles. Um, so bulk silver is what conventional mirrors are made of. It's, silver is normally very shiny and reflective, but if you nanostructure it, you can get um, nanoparticles that scatter colors depending upon the size of the nanoparticle. So on the right hand side, I'm showing you an optical microscope image of silver nanoparticles of different sizes ranging from about 10 um, to 100 nanometers in diameter. And you'll see that the scattering or the color that you observe for the different nanoparticles depends upon um, the size. So even though they're all the same material, different colors emerge from the size of these nanoparticles. One of the students in my lab has used these nanoparticles to kind of reproduce the craft of stained glass window making. So stained glass um, virtually gets its color from uh, embedded metallic nanoparticles in the glass. And my student has kind of optimized that process in our lab just to make large scale stained glass windows where he can very precisely control the color of the glass. So here's um, an image of some of the stained glass he's made using nanoparticles in our lab. Um, here's another picture. Um, my group is interested um, in some quantum effects in these small nanoparticles, and last year we published a picture, uh, paper um, in Nature magazine, but we paired up um, with one of my friends who's an artist and also a TED fellow, so she um, used some of the metallic nanoparticles that we make in our lab to make um, uh, paint. So basically she made grams of nanoparticles, turned them into like a colloidal dispersion, and then made macro scale art, and some of her paintings are in display um, in various museums across the country. So um, these are all silver nanoparticles, and you can see how the different color arises from the shape and the size. A second example of uh, material that we work with in our lab is semiconducting nanoparticles. So I'll give you an example um, with uh, cadmium sulfide. Perhaps many of you are familiar with this pigment. You can buy it in Michaels under the name cadmium yellow. It's basically a cadmium sulfur powder that's in an organic solution, and it's what Van Gogh used to make his Café Paris at night. So the yellow pigments in the Café Paris at night are basically cadmium yellow pigments. In our lab, in 
set up working with powders, so micron scale um, powders of cadmium and sulfur, um, we're very interested in the properties of nanoparticles that have just a couple hundred atoms in it. So here's a transmission electron microscope on the left-hand side of this slide, where each white dot is an atom of either cadmium or sulfur. And we've made a nanoparticle that has dimensions of just a couple nanometers. So if you make this material, it looks kind of yellow in solution, but then if you look at it in an um, ultraviolet light, the nanoparticles fluoresce. Um, so they glow um, very vivid colors, and depending upon the size of those nanoparticles, you can get the fluorescence to span the entire visible spectrum. So how are these nanomaterials made? I just wanted to include a quick video um, showing that generally we use kind of an atom-by-atom atom assembly in bulk solution. Um, so here we're making uh, metallic nanoparticles of different sizes, and basically we just started off with um, the right precursor salts, mix them together in the appropriate ratio such that individual atoms could start to assemble, and then we, um, as we grow the nanoparticles, we can terminate the reaction when we have the appropriate size of the nanoparticle that we want. We can also then use protein-directed assembly or DNA-directed assembly to take those individual nanoparticles and assemble them into larger structures um, based on the base pairing in um, nucleic acid. We can also use um, top-down assembly, since this is a laser, I figured I'd just include um, a slightly more artistic image um, from Da Vinci, but you can take a bulk material and then use something like ion beams or um, reactive ion etching, basically to mill away parts of the material to make two or three-dimensional um, structures or sculptures that have nanoscale dimensions. Okay, so the two applications I mentioned I wanted to discuss with you today um, were how solar cells um, can see more light with nanomaterials and how we can make objects invisible. So um, probably uh, many of you know that um, basically in one hour the sun provides more energy to the earth than we use in an entire year. So the sun is an enormous energy resource, um, but the sun spectrum is spread throughout um, a very broad range, with about 5% of the sun's power being in the ultraviolet, another 43% of the sun's light is in the visible, and 52% is in the infrared. And it turns out that conventional photovoltaic cells only really work to absorb the light that's at visible frequencies or higher, or very near infrared frequencies and higher. So about 30 to 50% of the sun's energy can't be absorbed by conventional photovoltaic cells. So all the um, infrared photons are basically passed through the photovoltaic cell, so it's as if the solar cell is transparent at those frequencies. So what my group is interested in doing is taking those long wavelength photons and combining them together such that you can take two lower energy photons